This would be devastating for Chloe and us. As I've already said, it has taken 15 years for us to find any acceptable respite solutions, and as Chloe has now left school and so far not started any college or daycare, there is no alternative that can be put into place. It would mean Chloe would be more isolated and more dependent on us, which would have long-term consequences. Chloe takes a long time to develop trust in relationships and finding carers with the right attitude and then putting the extra training their medical needs require in place means they have specialist skills that are not easily or quickly replaced. I am also sure that there are many other families that this will affect as well as ours and desperately hope that an acceptable solution can be found. I hope this gives everybody an insight into the devastating effects and changes that 2,700 tears and their families, you know, <laughs> will play a vital role in these children's lives. It's not just our lives that's going to affect, it's going to affect the children and their families as well. Thank you. Well, good evening, Durham Tears and Durham Tears supporters. I'm Spartacus. <laughs> Um, my background is I worked for the Learn Support Service for a number of years and then I left to go and to be a lecturer and I was a tutor and I've got students, ex-students, Valerie, in the background, uh, which is really nice. And then four years ago I left my job and I was asked to go back into school and I've been doing lots of, um, sort of counselling type things, very similar to what Lisa was talking about. Tonight, it's my opportunity to give, for the teaching assistants of Durham to be heard. And our next step is that the teaching assistants are then listened to. And these are your stories. So, we all know that we offer fantastic care and education in our schools. We also know that this is appreciated by the teachers and the parents that we work with then there's no value on that. However, these changes that are going to be put into place are actually going to be life-changing for a number of people. The distress, the anxiety, stress, I do believe that some people have already left their jobs. But this first story is Haley's story. <laughs> Woo! It was the bear. She could come down and tell it herself. Haley um, actually worked part-time while she was doing GCSEs and A-levels. She worked part-time while she did a degree. She got a job and worked full-time, but then she went back and studied part-time to become a teaching assistant. Gilda didn't want to work with children because her mother had worked with children and she was fed up with it all. She said, I was obsessed. <laughs> Never mind, Haley got a job. She worked with teenagers. And she came home one day with the best black eye I have ever seen. But Haley still went back to work, and then Haley continued to work with some very, very challenging young people. Haley would stay back at work, she would come in late, she would be kicked, spat at, she would have other bruises in other parts of her body. She came in very late one night because she'd sat with a very young boy who was going to be taken into care. This was a very challenging young boy. He cried and cried while he sat there till seven o'clock at night with him in school because he wasn't allowed to go home. That little boy begged him for her to take him home, to her home, where he felt safe and secure and cared for. Haley explained that she couldn't do that, it wasn't appropriate. And when three people turned up, oh bless her, she's crying. When those three people turned up to take that little boy to another county so that he would be safe, he begged Haley to go with him so that he would feel safe and secure and cared for. But Haley still went back to work. Then she got a job in the school with her mum. Worst thing ever. She gets on there. And Haley still works. Haley does six different intervention groups. 
and she also is the nominated medication supply uh, administrator in our school, and she's also our nominated first aid. Haley, not that long ago, was still working at 11 o'clock at night doing a PowerPoint presentation for school assembly. Haley is a single 29 year old female and she bought her house. It was a wreck. Her dad worked for two years on it and it was immaculate. Haley got a letter. And in that letter, Haley was told she was going to lose over £2,000 a year, and equivalent to about £240 a month. Haley's modest mortgage is £240 a month. Haley won't be able to afford rent. Haley won't be able to afford a mortgage. Haley has had to sell her house now because she panicked about how is she going to afford to keep up those payments. I've changed the locks so Haley can't come back home. <laughs> Her dad, who is nearly 67, has worked an extra year, two years. First year, it just wasn't ready. The second year was because I was going to lose £10,000 and Haley was, and he was worried about her losing her house. Fortunately, she sold it because she, she knows that she doesn't have any extra cash to pay for that mortgage. So she's already gone through that life changing event. So from there, that was Haley's story. She's okay, she's living with a couple of other blocks somewhere. But these things are not just happening to Haley. I could talk about Haley because it was personal to me. But I've heard of households where there are two parents who are teaching assistants and they are both going to lose money. Some households, it's more than £5,000 a year. These are your stories during teaching assistants. I've got a few little snippets. We have Stephen, another young man who's just come into being a teaching assistant in about the last year. And these are Stephen's words. I'm new to this role, however, I've embraced every opportunity to develop my skills to enable me to pursue a career that ignites my interest and my imagination. Through working with children, I have discovered my vocation. There is no greater motivation than being part of a child's learning and development. However, these proposals, if they go through, the financial impact will be huge. Stephen has just bought a house with his girlfriend. Stephen said he could perhaps take on a second job. But as Stephen said, I put 150% into my job. I don't think I have the energy to do anything. Then we have Sue, a single parent with a dependent mother. Sue is the only wage earner in her house. Sue is a little worried because her mother has lately started to develop things where she's getting a bit forgetful. Sue was considering perhaps reducing her hours. But because she's going to lose £2,000, she doesn't know what to do. And we have Sam, the lovely Sam, who gets into work before anybody else. Just after the caretaker, I think. I go in early, but Sam is always in earlier. Sam, another young person who has just committed, just before this all happened, to buying a house and planning a wedding. She is now worried about how she's going to meet that financial commitment. Perhaps like Haley, she may have to give it up. And then we have Lisa, who has, she only works part time, and then she has small children. Lisa has worked it out that she can't commit to those extra hours. And then Lisa, is, if she did, then she would have to pay for childcare. And because she's taken a reduction in wage, how is she going to pay for that childcare? She's in a low-wing situation. 
And these are people who have taken some information, I think at least they gathered from Facebook, and these are your stories. We have Trish, who's worked for 30 years. And she feels that she has had a title change, her, what if she's doing one day, the next day it changes. Having a large portion of her salary removed for her is the last straw. But she is going to fight on, like most of us will. I put these down, guys, because we're running out of time. This one struck me. This is Jane. I'm extremely worried, as I won't be able to afford to pay my rent. I feel a failure. I don't know why, but Jane feels a failure. She feels a failure as a mother because it is her responsibility as a single parent to provide a home for her son. But Jane isn't going to be able to pay her rent. She is frantically looking for a job with a higher wage and she's looking for a flat with lower rent. That is one of the saddest things that I have read. And then we go on to Helen. Helen feels that the prospect of these has made her lose her self-respect. These new pay and conditions. She feels trapped because of her age. She feels misled by the contract that was offered to her and she doesn't feel like she's got any enthusiasm for the job anymore. I suppose if you're an older person, then you're looking to what can you move into. But every story is individual. Some of these stories that we have here, some of you will be able to relate to. Whether you're a young TA, you've done it for 30 years or more, they all are going to have an impact. And the one thing that really struck me as a really, really good quote, and I'm going to recognise the person, which is Helen P. Cook, for this. And she said, every child matters, apart from teaching assistance children. how this is going to affect me personally. It's affecting me now. My mental health since this started is atrocious. I promised myself I wasn't going to cry. I cry every single day. I broke down, speaking to my head, you other day, handed me a tissue and walked away, couldn't look me in the face. I don't have children living at home anymore. Mine are fully grown. I'm in a very fortunate position I personally don't have a mortgage. However, the two and a half thousand pounds that I will lose is my transport money. I have a 50 mile commute to my place of work every day. I have a car and I have a motorbike. Both of those are going to be sold in Christmas. I can't afford to travel on the bus, it costs me 55 pounds a week to travel to my place of work by bus, and it's a three hour journey. I have looked for a job closer to home. However, every single HLTA job that is closer to my place of living has a disclaimer written at the bottom of the advert. If you accept this position, you are not entitled to the compensation payment being offered by Durham County Council. So I can't change my school. I can't change where I live. If I leave jobs in the next year, I have to pay that compensation money back. What do I do? They're taking my money away from me, which means I can no longer travel. 
I could walk. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I could, somebody actually told me, oh, you could bike. <laughs> yep, yeah, you've ever seen me on a push bike. It's not a pretty sight. And it took me three and a half hours to bike four miles last week. I tried it. It's never going to happen. There are enough hours in the day. So I am lucky in some respects. I, I don't have a mortgage. I'm not going to lose my home. But I'm already looking for work. I will be leaving. I've told my head I give myself this last year, and that's 17 years of working for Durham County Council and educating myself and improving myself down the drain for nothing. The quicker I can get out, the more likely I am to be able to keep my car and my bike, which is my absolute passion. The car will go first. Um, but that's how it affects me and it's not just me, it's everybody that's going to be affected by this, not just me. to get those personal uh, testimonies of how it's affected people. I think it's very powerful. Uh, and hopefully people will listen to that. One thing we talked about just a second, uh, just, just a few minutes ago, was about a resolution. And um, Debbie Hopper here from the DMA mentioned that we should put a resolution to the meeting. We've got uh, hundreds of people here and uh, I think it would be a good idea to, to uh, come up with something concrete that we can demand of uh, councillors and other parties uh, that are involved in this dispute. And when I say other parties, I think we also include people who have been activists in this dispute as well. So this is the suggestion that we uh, say, say this meeting, we make this resolution, this meeting calls on all interested parties Say that really. um, to get together to engage in meaningful discussions to resolve this dispute as soon as, as possible, as has happened in other parts of the country, including Tory run Barnet Council. In the absence of such a willingness to negotiate, strike action will become inevitable. I'd just like to tell you, I mean, we can't all kind of um, uh, individually talk about this, obviously, even at this point, but I think do, do people feel that that's a uh, a reasonable demand to make from this meeting? Yes. No names. <laughs> okay. And I think there'll be a lot of public support. You've heard some, and that, my heart beating stories raised tonight, and I'm sure what the people in the North East, and Durham in particular, you know, they didn't just listen to stories like that, they feel them. And uh, these people have got to realise what's at stake here. For individuals, we really don't have mental health problems. We've got all sorts of problems across our communities, which has become worse since the uh, 84, 85. And people have got the highest suicide in the country, in the district. You know, we've suffered enough. And I think we've got to get this done in an amicable way. Uh, people are okay at the end of the day. They might have to have a reduction, but the reductions of that nature are almost certain uh, to, to be sit very serious for anybody who's got to sustain them in times of austerity, where jobs are difficult, where sometimes one woman's came in the house and we just came in the house and so on. So I think the church council should check on board and try and get through the company association. I'm sure there'll be a big response to this meeting. I was delighted that so many people came. Uh, for us, it hasn't been in the brain, and let's hope we can get some resolved. Get on that table, and for Christ's sake, get the seats so <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, um, so one of the action points is to support the online campaign, which has been started so brilliantly by Helen and other people uh, on this stage as well. Um, so look out for the Value Us hashtag that's been mentioned already. Join the support our local teaching assistance Facebook page. 
And if you're a TA, talk to some of the people on the stage here and other, other TA activists who um, will talk to you about getting involved in the Facebook organising group, which has been incredibly important, I think. So there's that side of it. Um, obviously, sign the petition, but also get other people to sign the petition, other TAs, uh, other union members to sign that petition about industrial action and the ballot being held as soon as possible. Um, and then thirdly, um, I'm going to pass, pass on very quickly uh, the uh, All for One March with the, during the miners' uh, ballot. Just really, really quickly, if you want to find it, it is under All for One um, on Facebook. We are going to march it down with Mayton. Um, there has been t-shirts upstairs, they're not printed, they are black. And they were just sizing t-shirts, so if anybody wants one, if you catch me or send me a message on the Facebook page, you're basically going to say, can't be done teaching us this, and hashtag value us, and it's a lovely picture of a pain point crossed out. Um, so there's that, I was proud to be a, uh, proud to be a teaching assistant. Um, I haven't got the exact details of the time, but I said probably a, it's going to be early morning, because it is quite a long haul. Um, by the time you walk down. But we're going to wait and see who we're going to march with. So obviously there's the, the banners, the minus banners, and the brass bands and everything. We don't want to step on toes, so we're going to find out the exact what will be the best for us and the best to be the most respectful at the um, at the minors gala. We're not there in a protest like we did at County Hall where we nearly shut the roundabout and we're whistling and <laughs> screaming and whatever. This is just to it's just to walk together as one as a collective. Because, like I said to some like the people at Willingham, and I did sort of swear when I said it, and I won't, I can't wait to walk past that balcony at um, the county hotel with all the big wigs up there during the county council. I want to walk past them with my t shirt on, proud with our banner. So please get in touch if you want to. I just want to say uh, an absolutely enormous big thank you to Dave Hopper and the Durham Miners Association for all the support they've given us, but also for letting us this support. And it's very important that we realise this is just the start, this is going to be a long campaign and this is just the start. But thank you ever so much for coming tonight. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank Yes, certainly are. I mean, we're a trade union, uh, and the cause of trade unionism, in my opinion, is all over the world, especially in the present day. And these teachers, in my opinion, need to get a responsible settlement, a settlement that's not going to affect them in some of the ways we've heard from them tonight. I just hope everybody gets around the table as soon as humanly possible and tries to get a resolvement which everybody benefits from. Do you think that um, after um, the, the county have already decided that they're going to uh, dismiss and re-engage teaching assistants that they've got, they still have an opportunity to, uh, to turn that around? Well, I would hope that they're at least going to discuss it. Uh, if they can't turn it around, I would hope they, co they could and would do it because it's, uh, we've heard some tragic stories tonight of uh, how this is going to affect human beings after all. Absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, what's happening is wrong, unfair, possibly illegal. I certainly hope it's illegal because I wouldn't want the law of this country to allow it. In terms of uh, dismiss and re-engage, it's a bit of an unusual step to take, is it? Well, it's, it's the nuclear option. They moved to it far too quickly. There doesn't seem to have been a genuine attempt on anybody's part to get a resolution here. It's just confrontational. I don't believe it. I'm not a lawyer, but I can't see how you serve equality by actually reducing the pay of one of the protected sections of the equality legislation. This is anti-female, it's anti-woman. How can it be good for equality? It's going to be tough. I hope that their unions are going to back them every step of the way. 
and if they don't, I hope they're going to find their own independent legal advice because I cannot believe that what's happened is legal and it needs to be tested. I thought it was fabulous. I've never ever been in a room with that many teaching assistants in 26 years. I've never actually experienced anything like it. I think it was positive. I think um, people were nervous about finding the voice, but once they found it, I think it was it, it was a very, very worthwhile meeting. I think we feel supported, very supported. And do you think that uh, teaching assistants, given what's happened so far, still have a chance of winning this dispute? I think I read somewhere on somewhere some sites, some quote somewhere that if you, if you don't fight you can't win. So we fight it and then we try to win it. But if you don't, if you don't try, it's what we keep saying to the kids, you've got to try it because you never know. We can just keep trying and we'll keep fighting and hopefully we'll get an amicable resolution.